Hallelujah. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have perfected praise. See, God just cares about our heart. He doesn't care about our titles, our circumstances, our rank. He just cares that we love him and that we're seeking his face. Amen. That's the kingdom of God. Amen. Glory to God. Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, I was asked to minister today uh, on this Pastor's Appreciation Month. <laughs> and to honor my parents, <laughs> Pastor Doug and Ingrid Thompson. Amen. 25 years of ministry. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. And um, today we're going to get into the word and, you know, for those of you who do know me, please just pray for me. <laughs> and those of you who don't know me, just bear with me, please, <laughs> because um, I'm a little different in how I go through uh, things. But we're going to pray and we're going to uh, focus on what the word of the Lord has for us today. Amen. Amen. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your power in this place, Father God. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge you today. We acknowledge your grace on our lives. We are thankful, Father God. We ask that we will receive from you today, Father, everything that you have in store for us. Lord God, we thank you that no person will go unchanged today. Heavenly Father, but they will be transformed into the image of your word, into the image of your son in the name of Jesus. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, that no satanic force or influence will interrupt the, re the receptivity of the word of God today in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Father God, that we have hearts to receive. Holy Spirit, do your work on us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, you can be seated, please. So the message for today is, I struggled with how I wanted to word it, but um, we do understand that these days are trying times. And the more that we uh, go through this life, the more that we see that trouble is on the horizon. And that's not by mistake, that's not by fault, that's not by accident. All these things were already foretold in God's word. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. And I struggled with the message and what I wanted to call it, but essentially we're gonna talk about the blessing of Issachar and discerning times and seasons, wisdom, and discernment for the times and seasons that we are living in today. Amen? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about the blessing, and then we're going to go into um, the foundation for that, and then after that we're going to apply ourselves to, you know, what does this mean for us today? So just bear with me because we're going to go a lot of different places today. Amen? So starting off, um, in Genesis 49 and verse 13, in verse 15, we have Moses who's blessing the people, and they're about to go into the promised land. And the 12 tribes of Jacob um, all had their responsibilities within the nation of Israel. They had their niches. They had their uh, assignments. They had their anointings. And for one tribe, which was Issachar, Moses gave them a very specific blessing. And in that blessing, he said, Issachar is a strong donkey. He lies between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. And so what is this burden that Issachar was bearing? And what is it about the tribe of Issachar that's so important for us today, and what does it foreshadow for us today? So in 1 Chronicles 12 and verse 32, during the reign of King David, it says, the sons of Issachar 
who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their command. Amen? Amen. That means that the sons of Issachar corporately were wise. It wasn't just one individual, but they were corporately wise. It was a corporate anointing. It was a corporate assignment to serve the kingdom of Israel and to serve the King David. Amen? Amen. And so that is what we're going to talk about today in how wisdom is not just a principle that you apply, but wisdom is a spirit that can rest on you. Amen? Amen. The spirit of wisdom can rest on you. The spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel can rest on you, meaning that it does not depart from you, it stays with you, and it remains through you and in you. Amen? So what are some of the blessings of wisdom? In Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 12, it says, Wisdom is of defense, as money is a defense. But the excellence of wisdom is that it gives life to those who have it. Amen? Wisdom is a defense. It's better than money because it can give you eternal life. Wisdom is a defense to your faith. In Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 10, it says, If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. So when you have your faith that you're trying to apply and believe God in, if you don't sharpen your axe, if you don't sharpen your edge, if you don't sharpen your understanding, if you don't sharpen your discernment, it's going to require more effort. It's going to require more labor. It's going to require more struggle. But it says wisdom brings success. Amen? So wisdom is the oil to your faith. Okay? So, going back into wisdom and going back into the blessing of Issachar, um, and actually, let's go to uh, Psalms 1, and I'm going to read that real quick. Psalms 1, verse 1, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Verse 3, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Amen? So verse 3 is saying, whatever he does when he abides in the word of God will prosper. And so for me, especially when I was younger, um, just a teenager and a young man, younger man, (laughs) my question to God all the time was, how do I become successful? How do I have true success? And wisdom will unlock that for you. And so In Proverbs 24, verse 3 through 4, it says that wisdom is the way you build your spiritual house. So Proverbs 24 and verse 3 says, Through wisdom a house is built, by understanding it is established, through knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So your house spiritually is built on the foundation of wisdom. And through understanding, it is established. So you need wisdom to build, and you need understanding to establish yourself. And then once you have established yourself, knowledge fills the rooms of your house with all precious and pleasant possessions. So knowledge is one of these things where in 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1, you don't have to turn there, but in part it says knowledge puffs up but love edifies. So Paul is making that distinction that knowledge can puff up. The world can have knowledge. The world can have information. The world can have 
slivers of truth, and they are successful and succeed in just those areas. You have your doctors, your lawyers, your politicians, your accountants, your businessmen. They are operating in some form, in some realm of knowledge that is bringing them success. But knowledge alone will puff you up. You need wisdom and understanding, spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding to steward knowledge. You have to steward knowledge. You have to steward true knowledge. And you have to receive and be open to learning about knowledge. There's also the difference between real knowledge and false knowledge. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 20, the Apostle Paul is talking to Timothy and he says, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Verse 21, by professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. So in the world, you have, there are subsets of slivers of true knowledge, virtuous knowledge, but then you have false knowledge, deceptful knowledge. You have uh, different forms of uh, tarot cards, astrology, you know, what's your sign? You know, how do you align here? What's your, you know, what's your this, what's your that? esoteric conspiracies, all these things are considered false knowledge. At minimum, it's dark knowledge. You don't need any of that to succeed in Christ Jesus. And what's even more important is in 1 Timothy 6, uh, 21, Apostle, said, Apostle Paul said that by professing these things, your faith can stray away. So why is it good to have knowledge. In Hosea 4 and verse 6, it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. Rejecting true knowledge can get your calling of God removed and it can impact your family. That's what the word of the Lord says. And fast forward to the New Testament, Jesus told his disciples on that last day in Matthew 7 and verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practiced lawlessness. So on the last day, God's going to separate the sheep from the goats, and that is going to be based off of those who are walking in true knowledge. Amen? Amen? So we're going to fast forward and we're going to start going a little bit faster now. <laughs> because of the times that we now live in, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you should understand what's going on. He said in Luke 12 and verse 46, hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and the earth, but how is it that you cannot discern this time? Why is this? Because in the world today, you have people who know the truth and suppress it in unrighteousness. It's not that they have not been shared the word of God. It's not that they have not received the goodness of God. But because of their own desires, they are actively suppressing the truth. In Romans 1, verse 8 through 21, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, in them, for God has shown it to them, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So God says, as those who are revealed the truth, but reject it or suppress it so they can fulfill their own desires, it causes their hearts to become darker and darker and darker. And that's what you're seeing in the world today. That's what you're seeing in the world today. This is the backdrop of what we are experiencing 
And this is the basis of what we're going to continue to talk about, about why you, it is important for you to have this wisdom, to have this knowledge, and for it to rest on you. Amen? All right, so now we're going to go a little bit deeper. Let's go to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 22. And then we're going to go forward after that. So Daniel chapter 2, and verse, uh, starting at verse 21, the kingdom of Babylon has already taken over the nation of Israel. They've been led captive. You had the Jews who were the uh, strongest of Israel who were being trained by Nebuchadnezzar to serve in his court. And at that time, uh, the king of Babylon was receiving dreams that he could not interpret, and he needed Daniel, or he needed someone to interpret this dream for him, or he was going to kill all of his wise men. And so Daniel says in uh, uh, chapter, uh, Daniel chapter uh, 2, verse 21, he says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Verse, uh, sorry, that's verse 20, verse 21. And he changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and he raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Verse 22, he reveals deep and secret things. He knows what dwells in the darkness and light dwells in him. Amen? And so we have Daniel declaring that God will change times and seasons. He will declare a change in seasons. He will put up kings and he will place down kings. And also, he knows what's in the darkness and light dwells in him. All right. Well, Brother Jeremy, I know all that. All right. Let's go talk about something else then. Let's go to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 5. Actually, let's start at verse 4. So Daniel, because he was faithful to God in an ungodly kingdom and environment, he would frequently have visions and revelations of the end times. And in this particular revelation that we're going to touch on later, Daniel is seeing the Antichrist uh, persecuting the church of God and taking them through great tribulation. And so in verse 4, the angel that is ministering to Daniel says to him, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Verse 5, then I, Daniel, looked and there stood two others, one on this riverbank and the other on that riverbank. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Verse 8, although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Verse 9, and he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Verse 11, and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there should be 1,200 
in 90 days. Verse 12, blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will rise to your inheritance at the end of the days. That's three and a half years. So going back to verse 6, Daniel is having a vision. And in this vision, there are three men, one on one side of a riverbank, the other on the other side of the riverbank, and one above the riverbank. And they ask the man above the riverbank, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? And he said, time, times, and half a time. That word time in the Hebrew translates to appointed time. And in the Greek, appointed time means kairos. And the other type of time, which is sequential time, the time that is natural time, that is chronos. And so in this passage of scripture, you have an appointed time, an appointed times, and a sudden time. Meaning that as long as it is determined by the Lord, we are going to continue to see the pattern of the end times until he comes. And we do not know how long the fulfillment of these wonders shall be. But we know that they will increase in frequency. They will increase in evidence, and they will increase in demonstration. And so when you see these things happen, it is not for us to be afraid or concerned or even overly perplexed, because these things must be so. Amen? Daniel said, I do not understand. When will these things be over? And the Lord told Daniel, go to sleep. (laughs) You are not going to see the end of these things, Daniel, but you are going to awake to your inheritance at the end of the days that was just described to you. Amen? And so it's good for us to understand the times and the seasons that we are living in because they are an appointed time. They are in appointed times. There are sudden times. So we see things in history. We see things now that may look like the end, but it's not yet. But rest assured, it is a foreshadow of what is to come. You're not mistaking this. You're not misunderstanding this. It is a foreshadow of the fulfillment of those things that will come. And Daniel was able to prosper in a godless environment that also worshipped the exaltation of man and the exaltation of self. Nebuchadnezzar was a unique king in that he was not one that worshipped other gods, but he had nations worship him. That's how he was different from the other kings. There were gods, but he had them worship himself. That golden image that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were asked to bow down to was the image of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon is the image of the last kingdom of the last days. So let's go to Matthew verse 24, chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, in verse... Three, the disciples also ask Jesus the same question when they're on the Mount of Olives. They say, in verse 3, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 7, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Verse 8, and all these are the beginning of sorrows. And so Jesus lays the groundwork for them that 
the wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes in various places, nation rising against nation, these are the birth pains of the end. They are the quakes and the quivers of creation understanding that Christ is soon to come. And so some, what are some of the natural events that have occurred up until now? In February of 2023, February 6, 2023, Turkey and Syria had a 7.8 magnitude earthquake that killed 47,244 people. Compared to 9-11, that was 2,966 people, and that is over 1,000% more than those who died in 9-11. Uh, during COVID in the year 2020, across all the countries, it's estimated 3 million people died from COVID-related illnesses. If you were to split all of the countries, the 195 countries together, that's 15,384 people per country. In Kenya, in 2019, there was a locust swarm from 2019 until 2022 that moved across Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, India, and destroyed over 2.25 million hectares of land. That is, one hectare of land is 107,000 acres, resulting in over $9 billion worth of damages. And you can look this up. These are not. Uh, these these are all on the in the news on the press. Look it up. You have weather conditions. You have blizzards in California. You have wildfires in Canada. Every year, weather gets worse and worse. In 2010, Haiti had an earthquake that killed 360,000 people, the second worst in recorded modern history. In 2011, Japan had a 9.0 magnitude earthquake and tsunami that killed 19.5 thousand people. And now you have conflicts in Syria, Israel, and Ukraine. This is happening now. This is happening today. And souls that are passing on into eternity need to hear the gospel. And so, going in back into appointed times, we have Christ and God the Father who sits outside of time and their authority over time. God the Father is referred to as the Ancient of Days in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 1. And that Christ is called the Son of Man in that same chapter. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. It starts with him, and it ends with him. And so when we have Christ, who is the word of God, it says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it. The word that became flesh and came to see us was the appointed time, and he shows us secrets of his word in the Gospels according to how he wants us to view time, and not just chronological time, but appointed Kairos time, all right? So, the word that became flesh, that's why I read that scripture to you. We're going to go to Matthew 21 and verse 5. And in Matthew 21 and verse 5, Jesus is about to have his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And this was the time that was prophesied for himself regarding his crucifixion. And during that time, Jesus told his disciples, he said to them, now, when they drew to Jerusalem, Matthew 21, verse 1, when they drew to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples and said to them, go to the village opposite of you. Immediately you will find a donkey tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. 
Verse 4, all this was one that might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a foal and a foal, the colt of a donkey. And the disciples went to him as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their, their clothes on him, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and said and cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed be him uh, who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the highest. Verse 10. And when he had come to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Verse 11. So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of, from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, the reason why I'm indexing into that is because Jesus commanded his disciples to bring forth the coal, the colt, and the donkey. A colt is a, a, baby, a baby donkey. And to bring them to him so that he could ride them through Jerusalem. And that was for the sole purpose of him to fulfill the word that was spoken by him. And so if you go back to the blessing of Issachar, why is Issachar called a donkey? Why is Issachar carrying a burden? Because Issachar is known in the scriptures for wisdom. There's nothing special about a donkey. If anything, donkeys can be considered stubborn. But when you have a mule that's able to handle its load, it is one of the most reliable forms of transportation that you can have, especially in the uh, early days. Issachar is just a vessel for the wisdom that God wants to give to his people. So when Jesus brought the donkey, he was full of wisdom, grace, and truth. And he rode at an appointed time into Jerusalem in order to fulfill the word that was spoken of him. No more, no less. There's nothing special about the donkey. There's nothing special about Issachar, per se, except that he is a vessel. When you are a vessel, God can rest on you. When you are a vessel, God can give you an assignment. When you are a vessel, it doesn't matter the, the breadth or the depth of the assignment because God is using you to move. And he used his word to get to that donkey. So you can see the patterns there. Because it was a blessing. Moses blessed Issachar. I don't remember the last time anyone that was called a donkey was considered blessed. So where, where, is, the, where is the relationship there? Why, why did Issachar bow down to bear his burden? Why did he become a band of slaves? He came down because through the wisdom that he was stewarding, he became a servant to the people. He became a servant to the people of God. He became a servant to the children of Israel. And he knew what to do. Corporately. Amen? It's, it is said of Christ that over 400 scriptures in the Old Testament point to his coming before he arrives. And every single one of these prophecies had to be fulfilled. And in, in addition to that, You have what in the Bibles, in the, in the book of the prophets, you have what they call uh, the burden of Isaiah, the burden of Amos, the burden of Hosea. Why are they called burdens? Because those vessels had to steward the word of the Lord to the people. Is that making sense? Willingly or unwillingly? So you have in the same... Uh, time frame when Jesus has entered into the city of Jerusalem triumphantly, the next day he goes outside of uh, Jerusalem into Bethany and he becomes hungry. So let's go to Mark chapter 11. Starting at verse 12. Verse 12. 
Now the next day when they had come out of Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Verse 14, in response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And the disciples heard it. Verse 15, so when they came to Jerusalem, Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those. Oh, sorry, let's skip um, verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Verse 21, and Peter remembering to him said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you have cursed has withered away. Verse 22, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things spoken shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. Verse 24, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Verse 25, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Verse 26, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And I'm going to come to that in a minute. But Jesus, the next day after he has come into Jerusalem riding triumphantly, he clears out the temple. And actually in that part of the passage, he tells to uh, the disciples, out of the mouth of infants you have perfected praise. And so when he comes out the next day, he's hungry. So Jesus Christ, which means anointed one, has now come in his chronos and his kairos moment into Jerusalem. And at this moment, Christ, the anointed one, the word that becomes flesh, comes to a fig tree, and the fig tree has nothing to give him. But the fig tree, in response to Christ, says, it's not the season for figs. Therefore, Christ, the word that became flesh, rebukes, curses the fig tree, and it withers up. And that becomes the model for us for how we should stand in faith. What, why is that important? Because you have to look at it from Christ and his position and his presence from when he stood at the tree. The tree should have delivered to Christ whatever he needed. The tree said... It's not the season. This Kronos time doesn't line up with this Kairos time. Therefore, I cannot give you any fruit. And Jesus, the word that became flesh, Christ, the anointed one, rebukes the tree. What does that mean? It means that when Christ has come for the appointed time for your breakthrough, for your prayer, for your miracle, for your blessing, it's time to receive. And when is the time when Christ shows up? (laughs) And when is he going to show up? Whenever he wants to. So be ready. Your Kronos time cannot override God's Kairos moment for your life. Otherwise, you can be deemed unfruitful. So the presence of the Lord and the fulfillment of God's word in your life at an appointed time, times, or suddenly. (laughs) That's why the, the word says, wait on the Lord and he shall renew your strength. He shall mount you up on wings like eagles. You shall run and not be weary. You shall walk and not faint. When you are standing in faith, it's up to Christ, the anointed one, to fulfill the word that has been spoken. And when he gives you that word, it's a word you are stewarding. It becomes your burden. It becomes, you don't know whether it's willingly or unwillingly. When God told Abraham, you will be the father of many nations, his body was as good as dead. But it did not matter to God, his chronos time. 
The Kairos time moment is when he brought forth a son that became the head of nations. That is the father of faith. And I only have seven minutes. <laughs> yeah, I don't have enough time. Um, so when we are talking about Christ and his word and his anointing, wisdom and discernment allows you to steward grace. Because Christ Jesus, the word that became flesh, they said, of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. So you need wisdom to steward as a vessel the revelation, the grace, the blessing, the promise of God in this time. Because the devil will try to make you disqualify yourself. He cannot remove you from your place, but he will try to disqualify, get you to disqualify yourself. And how will he do that? He will do it through offense. That's why when Jesus, I'm rushing now, but that's why Jesus said, when you stand praying, forgive. Because when you are offended, God cannot open up the windows of heaven for your life. But the problem and the crux of this moment is in the last days, there will be many offenses. There will be many false witnesses. There will be a falling away. There will be lawlessness and ungodliness in high places, all for the sake for those to curse the name of God. So if you want to leverage your righteousness over the righteousness of God because of an offense that will come, it will hinder the breakthrough, the miracle, the blessing that God wants to have in your life. And you cannot use the chronos time as a reason for the appointed time. I want to be married. I want to have a child. I want to, I want to be successful. I want to have my ministry. I want, to, I want this person to be healed. I want this person to be raised up. I want this person to be saved. That's all appointed time. That's appointed time. When you do it in the way that God has ordained for you to do it, when he has ministered and confirmed to you the promises that he has spoken over your life. Amen? Amen. And so offenses is the last area. How do we apply this? You have to, we have to be diligent for our hearts to remove any offenses. And there's two types of offenses. There's the offense of the gospel and the offense of sin. The offense of the gospel are people who are going to hate you because you are a child of God. They're going to hate what you say because you are a child of God. They are going to be mad at you, upset at you, isolate you, talk about you behind your back because you profess Christ. That is the, that is the world being offended. But Christ said in Matthew 21 and verse 24, Have you not read the scriptures? The stone which the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the world's, the, uh, the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 8, it says, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. We are to the world because the world that's not ready to submit to Christ sees us as offensive to their lifestyle. And the kingdom of Babylon was not just about dominion. Pharaoh in Egypt was an oppressor. He didn't care. You were a slave. Assyria was a destroyer. Whenever they came, they, they wrecked havoc to all the cities. Babylon, the way they ruled their people was through deception. Babylon was, you were in Babylon, but they wanted Babylon to get inside of you. So Daniel chose not to defile himself with the king's meat, not just because it, of the food type, but because it was offered to idols. The food and what we take in spiritually, is it sanctified by God or is it sanctified by Babylon? And I really can't even go further because I'm out of time. Um, so when it comes to offenses, 
The world wants you to think the way they think in Babylon. It's not enough for them to oppress you. It's not enough for them to destroy the fruit of your ground. They want you to think the way you think so you can serve them with your gift. Daniel, Balshazar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they gave them another name to serve in Babylon with your God-ordained gift. That is essentially what we have today and what Christ foreshadows as the falling away of uh, the body of Christ. There is a falling away before the return of Christ because what you take in is what comes out of you, ultimately. Okay, so I'm going to skip through some things and I'm going to talk about five areas where we can not deceive ourselves when it comes to offenses and we'll be done. The first area... Uh, Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 uh, do not be deceived God is not marked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap verse 8 for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life the second area of not being deceived is in your company in verse Corinthians 15 verse 33 do not be deceived Evil company corrupts good habits. Verse 34, awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. Uh, the third area of not deceiving ourselves, not allowing the enemy to deceive us in the area of offense. And that is, is God does not tempt you. James 1 and verse 13, it says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Verse 14, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. The fifth area is if you think you are standing in faith, take heed to yourself and your heart, lest you fall. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, Therefore, to him who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. Verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be, be able to bear it. Verse 15, Therefore, my beloved, flee... Or verse 14, Ooh. Flee my, <laughs> verse 14, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Verse 15, I speak to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. So those five areas, and you can write those five areas down, are the areas where we, do, we have to check our hearts so that we do not get ensnared by the wisdom of the world. And I didn't even get a chance to go into that. But what you sow is what you will reap to your flesh or to your spirit. Who The company that you keep will either edify you or it will corrupt you. God in his holiness and his righteousness and his sovereignty is not tempting you with sin. God in his holiness and his righteousness and his sovereignty is not committing sin against you. Job struggled with why he was going through what he went through and he blamed God ultimately. And God had to show him, where were you before I, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Job, there's a plan. There's something happening right now. Christ has to be crucified. I need a man to be righteous and experience persecution so that my perfect righteousness can be fulfilled. We don't know always why offenses land at our doorstep, and they will land at our doorstep. But we have to understand that that does not negate the promises of God entering into our life. Amen. And verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, any man who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. And that's what Jesus was talking about in Mark, where he said, uh, when you stand praying, forgive others so that you do not stumble over the, uh, the chief cornerstone, so that you are not broken over the chief cornerstone, that you can stand and remain intact because we all sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But God is faithful between James 1 verse 16 and Hebrews 10 and verse 12 to not tempt you 
beyond what you are able. As a child of God, you will not be tempted beyond what you are able. That's a promise from his word. So therefore, these five areas you can apply and you can stand on them when you're trying to get your victory, when you're trying to get your breakthrough, when you're trying to get your blessing. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm out of time. <laughs> Amen. 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 So there's one thing that uh, we can do, and we can make some confessions, and you can repeat after me or you can say it to yourself, but it's just going to be some prayer points in association with wisdom and discernment. Amen? Amen. So starting off, Heavenly Father, I ask that you release me from any offenses I have caused and that I may forgive any offenses done towards me. Heavenly Father, I ask that you give me supernatural patience and supernatural endurance according to your will. I pray that you reveal to me what is my responsibility in faith and what is your responsibility in faith. And that I am ready whenever you answer. Heavenly Father, I pray that the spirit of wisdom, discernment, and understanding rests on me in my life. Heavenly Father, I pray that you use me as a vessel to be a sign and a wonder in the earth towards my family, towards my community and towards the nations. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.